Hi everyone, I'm back with another video chat um, with another very good friend of mine. I spent last month talking a little bit about how working with different species has helped me with the species I work with most frequently. And I wanted to talk with Cindy Martin today um, because she also has worked with a bunch of different animals and she's just a wonderfully fun person to talk to and to hear stories from. Um, I met Cindy originally thanks to Alexandra Kurland because I was thinking of, I was looking for other ways to further my education and she suggested the Karen Pryor Academy dog training course and said that she knew someone, Cindy Martin, who was in the course um, and Alex had coached Cindy a bunch as well, and I, even before talking to her, I knew I was going to like her because when I found her on Facebook, I saw pictures of her fox hunting and that she had bull terriers, and I have a brother who fox hunts and has bull terriers, and he's crazy, and I love him, and that's kind of the way it worked out with Cindy as well. Uh, Cindy works in lives in Arkansas. Um, she does not have a website, but you can reach her at her email address if you want to contact her. Um, I know she travels to Kansas on a somewhat regular basis to give clinics there and also does other traveling for um, training sessions or clinics or whatever. So anybody who wants to reach out to her, I would highly recommend doing it. Um, I have always admired her ability to put her hand on resources such as helpful articles and studies. I consider her a librarian of sorts because she's great at putting her hands on things when you want to say, no, I know I read this somewhere, or I know I heard about that, and before you know it, Cindy's got her hands on the original resource. So she herself is a great resource, and this was a wonderful conversation we have that I am sharing with you. So I hope you enjoy it. So, so different species that you've worked with. I know we talked about a little bit about all the different things that you have worked with. Um, obviously dogs, obviously horses, obviously you have a mule and a donkey yourself. We do. I know you have worked with that steer you go to a clinic where somebody brings a steer which is just awesome johan paula blau and johan i know they're so cool lambs that you helped somebody with their lambs right so i mean to me it's just intriguing how when i work with different species how it it educates how I work with my own or other things. So that's why I, I know you've worked with a bunch and I thought it'd be fun to talk to you about that. Yeah, different species. Well, you know, as you know as well, <clears throat> just working with different individual horses or yeah. different individual dogs, you, you know, you'll start to see the differences. And, and I gained some perspective on that way back in my fox hunting days because I was real involved with caring for the hounds and we had, you know, we bred our hounds and we kept the hounds that we bred. It wasn't like we were, you know, distributing them. So we had entire litters of, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten hounds. And I would see the litter mates, see the similarities and the differences. And sometimes we would breed that same set of parents a year or two, two years later, and then I would see the differences between the litters. So I've always been really attentive to that. And then when you jump from species to species, um, I think you get even more insights um, about, I get more insights about myself yeah. as well as about them. Um, one thing that has really jumped out to me crossing species is um, the pace of my training I've had to adapt my, the pace of my training, um, even, even just going from the horses to the donkey. Yeah. And I know you've worked with donkeys now and, and there's, 
you know, if somebody was going to get really picky, they go, oh my gosh, this animal has, you know, huge latency in response to his cues. You know, he's like, there's this, but there's just this very thoughtful processing time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad uh, you say that because I, that's definitely true (laughs) too that I've worked with, but they're also have a really rough background. So it's interesting to hear you say that. And are they, are the, are yours really, really gentle? I mean, let's just barely graze your hand when they yes it's it's very slow it's very deliberate and you know you're talking to somebody who has horses that and when I first started with some of them they were you know sucking your whole hand into their mouths (laughs) you had to spend a little time on gently taking the reinforcers and also paying attention to the situation and seeing if that was contributing to them being a bit overly emotional and intense about the food but yeah even even in sort of stressful situations, Sammy's very deliberate and thoughtful. And that fits with what I've read about donkeys, that, um, you know, they're more likely to freeze okay. when they perceive a threat than horses. Horses are like, we're out of here, right? Yeah. But donkeys, because of, of where they evolved, they don't live in as tight a herd. They still have a social group, but they are spread over greater areas because they have to forage more um, for their brows and their feed. So they don't stay in a tight little group and they don't have that benefit of a group, you know, running together from danger. And so they tend to freeze and they, you know, evolved in really rough, rocky conditions. So running like, you know, a horse on the, prairies is not as much of an option so donkeys are very thoughtful and they assess things you know Sammy's always very thoughtful and um cute story was our donkey Sammy and he was I wouldn't call him a rescue because we did actually go purchase him but we ended up my husband looked at me and said we have to buy him and get him out of here <laughs> so um he he was a very avoidant of a halter when we first got him. And he, uh, so I retrained him on the halter. And what I had to do was instead of standing in the normal position, you would stand to put a halter on an equine head, you know, usually where you're on the left side and depending on their size, you're gonna, you know, bring the loop up over their nose and, and flip the crown piece over or Sammy's, I don't know what he, I like, lose track of measuring when they're small but I can put my arm over his withers with no problem so he's I don't know 10 11 hands or something so I could reach right over his neck and hold the halter below his nose well no (laughs) that will not be happening at first so what I did was I changed my position and I took a loop of rope and I shaped him to put his nose through the loop and then with me standing in front of him And then I transitioned to a halter and got him sticking his nose in. So the antecedents to putting the halter on were different than than typically they had been for him. And once I did that, he was great about getting haltered. But he has this thing where I if I so now I can put my arm over his neck and hold out the halter. But if I do that and I just start to pull it on, he'll pop his nose up again, like, oh, so I, I, it's so funny, because I'm standing next to him, and his eye is just about even with mine, it's a little bit below my eye, and I hold the halter open, and there's this moment where his eye shifts to me, and I know his attention, he's literally made eye contact with me with his left eye, and if I then pull the halter up, he stands still and doesn't throw his head and doesn't avoid. And that, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I'm not, I don't need to overcome that speed bump in our training. It's like, you know, as you and I have discussed with, with our particular emotionally um, virulent horses that, (laughs) you know, or as, as my friend Jane, uh, Messinio Lindquist, who used to be Jane Killian, says, attention is the mother of all behaviors. If you don't have their attention, you're not getting very far. And it's it's sort of that little acknowledgement of, it's like Sammy's consent cue to me. Yeah. Like, yeah. I've made eye contact with you. You may now put the halter on my head. Yeah. And, and, and so that leads me to, because 
jumping species, you've had great ideas. I know you've seen on, I've seen on the KPA list for teaching dogs to wear muzzles or head halters. You talk about teaching them to put their nose into a yogurt container or a cottage cheese container or something. And that's sort of a similar idea because you said with Sammy, you started with a rope, not a halter. So removing that um, object, which I think sometimes it's as loaded for the human as it is for the person. I mean, as it is for the animal, yeah. um, but you know. Well, and that came from actually um, training Scout to wear a, bat, uh, a grazing muzzle. Okay, okay. And I started with a, you know, a you know, small bucket so you can get at the feed store. Yeah. And I would just drop a couple of pellets in that. And then as she got better, I put the basket muzzle or the, the grazing muzzle inside the bucket. So I got her, you know, it was that sort of Kay Lawrence, get the movement pattern going and then sort of fade in the object. Um, so I got her, you know, she was like, sure, let me stick my nose in a bucket and eat some pellets, right? You know, sign me up. And then I put the, the muzzle inside and kept dropping the pellets in till she got really comfortable with, the sensation of that thing being down around her mu around her muzzle and you know where it was where she could see it around her eyes and things and then um i you know fastened it on and started feeding her pellets and things through the the hole in the bottom and so when i started to work with dogs with aggression issues and work on dog things more and dog behavior stuff i was like well you know I've sort of developed this this premise that a lot of the veterinary issues that we have with our horses, our dogs, you know, our animals that we tend to have vet work done with are less about how sort of physically painful and aversive they are, but they're more about the uncertainty and the startle response, right? The vet walks up smashes his thumb against the jugular jams the needle in and you know pulls blood on the horse and the horse goes what happened and and i see that with the dogs like you know nobody's ever stuck anything in their ear and suddenly they're in this you know Headlock. restraint hold and somebody's lifting and putting something in their ear with the otoscope and you know they're pulling their lips up and they have no experience with that it's like i'm in this new place and I'm on the slippery table. And, and so I really think um, that I, Porter taught me that, that that whole startle effect, that uncertainty, just like Percy with like, you know, oh my God, a leaf moved <laughs> in my environment. And, and so see, here's comes this startling thing. So if you think about, you know, they've never had something around their nose and and even with the horse they haven't had something as comprehensive as a grazing muzzle that if you can get them actively sort of putting their nose in feeling that sensation in a situation where if there are any bad feelings they're not attached to the the goal object you know your basket muzzle so i don't want the dog to see the basket and go, oh my god the last time you know i saw that I was scared. And so instead, it's like, well, if I mess up with the yogurt container with the bottom cut off, and, and so sometimes I'll actually with with the dogs, I'll start um, even without the container, I'll just put a treat on the ground and they eat it off the ground and I'll put another treat on the ground. And so three or four of those and they're like, oh, cool. She just puts treats on the ground and I get to eat them. And then I'll put this yogurt container that's cut down very small so they're not getting their you know it's not going way up by their eyes yeah. it's cut really short and there's and and i'll set that down and i'll stick the treat in it well right where i've been putting the treat so the dog's like oh cool i can stick my nose in there and they get used to sticking their nose in there isn't that great and then i'll lift it up and i'll hold the treat you know through the opening and just sort of lure them in they stick their nose in and i'll let them nosh on the treat for a couple of seconds so that you're already building duration in the sensation of the thing around their nose. By the time you get to a basket, and then I'll, you know, as they get better, I'll use a, a deeper one, uh, a deeper container so that it goes further up and it, it rests just below their eyes, which is where the basket muzzle is going to be. And then I'll set the basket muzzle inside that container. 
and had them getting the treats out so that by the time and and I've lifted up the container and had you know lured them through the opening several times so when I lift up the basket muzzle and lure them so they'll shove their nose into the basket muzzle and I'm not putting it on them they're putting their nose into it it's not a foreign unexpected they don't know the answer the answer is easy they've been doing it they've done it with a couple of different objects okay now we're doing it with this thing and so you you remove that whole uncertainty element for the animal and and honestly that all came from teaching scout to wear a grazing muzzle and the great thing about the way you taught <clears throat> scout to wear the grazing muzzle too is that i mean great for anybody who may be listening who isn't a horse person a grazing muzzle limits the amount a horse can eat with the muzzle on so that they don't get overweight or sick from eating too much but right. A lot of times people put them on and then toss the horse out in the field and say, go figure it out. And they end up really frustrated because they can't eat. And the way you're doing it, you've taught her that, yeah, she can eat with this thing on and it's okay and it's comfortable and it's good. So when you put it on her to, you know, take her out to graze, she's like, okay, I know how to do this. And so I can see that really limiting the stress situation as well. Yeah. It just takes out the, the, it, it just eliminates the questions they don't have an answer to. Right. 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 I like that. That's an interesting um, yeah. way you put that. Um, much worth thinking about some more. So that's good. So how about the steer? What was oh, he? God. He was, he was huge. <laughs> he uh, was huge. This is, this is, oh, he's a full grown beef steer. And his name is Johan. Huh? Horns? Uh, no. Okay. He was dehorned. Yeah. Um, or he might've been, I don't, I, I, I mean, I assume he is commercial. He, what, I don't think he was a specific breed, but, okay. um, but uh, he what, it was interesting, you know, and it, it, again, it, 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 meeting this woman and her steer and she's, she's worked with a number of, she actually rides him. She's taught him to go to a target object um, she had a big yellow uh, bucket, like sort of like a, you know, empty cat litter container or something. And that was his, he would walk to that. Yeah. Um, when we started to work, <clears throat> um, it, it, it kind of surprised, it, you know, me because of my background, it sort of shocked me because, you know, we use, make such shameless use of our food delivery our reinforcement delivery to set our horses up. And I do it with the dogs too. You know, if you've got a dog that's jumping on everybody, if you're putting treats on the ground, their feet are on the ground, their weight is forward, their head is down. It's sort of the opposite of them in launch position, ready to jump on the person again. And, and so when she would feed him, he would tip his head way up. And of course his big old, that huge, you know, bovine tongue would come out and sort of wrap around the, she, I think she used like cattle cubes or something and it would wrap around and suck it in, but he would always fling his head up and take it. And I, and so one of the things I said was, well, now what, um, you know, is that how he really needs to take it? Or is that just kind of how the two of you have developed your way of, you know, Re, of the reinforcement process and and she had to think about it a bit so we played around because one of the things she wanted to work on was teaching him to lift his feet for hoof care okay right and god knows all of us with the equines that, that you know is very a very common thing that we run into um with folks is they've got horses that are bad for for hoof care whether it's just picking out or it's specifically the person walking up with the the you know the farrier apron on and the rasp in their hand um you know we we all run into that at different times and um oh well, that's one to keep in mind for your long ears that hind leg ninja kick <laughs> be very i learned from them that if there's any sign of that to take a pool noodle and and just start touching them mm. up by their withers and things and clicking and treating for them accepting that and then work it to the back so that i could sort of get them used to being touched back there and associate it with being clicked and treated without putting myself in 
ninja kick range because well there's a question for you because that's i mean one difference that i have i i have seen between cattle and horses is that cattle a cow kick is just sort of a random kick out it's not back it's just sort of this random kick out whereas horses aim now yeah. where do monkeys fall on that scheme oh aim baby they do have that <laughs> okay they're yeah. like snipers there was a great picture in a magazine of a little pony hunter, you know, really super fancy little being brought out for a jog up, you know, and his little rider all done up and this pony looking perfect. And the photographer caught this amazing picture. There was a flower pot sitting on some sort of stand that he was, you know, at horse shows, everything's all fancy yes. and there's flowers everywhere. And this pony was walking by and the photographer caught just as the pony with one hind foot made contact with that pot. Oh, and beautiful. And I thought, that is how a horse aims. You know, it's not some random, <laughs> ah, get away from me, but it's, I don't like that pot. I am going to kick that pot because the thing was no bigger than the pony's foot. So, yes. They know, is, yeah, they know. It's just like dogs, you know, have dog, a dog will air stamp. Yes. Right. If, if you if you pushed them too far, they'll air snap and they know exactly they know exactly what they've done yeah. or, you know, the ones that have actually escalated to the point where they'll they'll snap at. But they have bite inhibition and they won't like they'll snap at, but they don't actually uh, they might even make contact, but they don't they like they pull their punch just before they get there. And the same with the horses that you know, they were like, uh, I don't actually want to kick the heck out of you. <laughs> yeah. I want you to know, I, I know exactly where you are and I can reach you if I need to. And so, then, you know, when people say, oh, he tried to kick me. And I say, no, he didn't try. He wanted to, he would have seen. <laughs> that was a warning <laughs> shot across the bow. Yeah. And, and I will tell you a, another Sammy story. So uh, I discovered that, that Sammy, loves to have the underside of his tail mm. stroked, the real soft skin on the underside of the dock of his tail and so it, that is actually almost as powerful a reinforcer for him as food yeah. okay. it's really interesting and uh so then he started you know going swinging his hindquarters to me hey, you could scratch my butt. And I thought, oh, I can't, I can't let that, I can't let him solicit that. It needs to be a reinforcer. Yeah. So I'm, I made a point of teaching him to touch a target object on the fence, you know, about my blue scarf for yeah. Rosie. Yeah. So I would, uh, if he wanted his butt scratched, he had to go over and and station himself next to the blue scarf. And then I would click and I would, uh, you know, um, stroke the underside of his tail and his tail goes up and sticks yeah. straight out. And, and, and I, but I just knew that, you know, cause I mean, even if my husband, if he went to swing his hindquarters toward my husband, he might misinterpret it, not to mention other people. And, you know, I sort of do live my life with the idea that I could get hit by a bus and somebody else might have to step in and take care of all these animals that have all these behaviors that <clears throat> they've learned and these expectations that they've developed about being around people yeah. and yeah. so I'm I you know try to make sure we with whatever ones that that they know a safe behavior like you know backing away from a gate or going and stationing at the scarf that's down at the the hinge end of the gate so that rather than crowding into you as you come in through the gate so i interrupted okay. you about johan and his okay. tongue his head up yeah and so what we played around because she wanted to uh work on hoof lifts and of course you know i mean you you have cattle cattle so you can appreciate but i mean it's just this huge body i mean his head is uh, is you know way bigger than a basketball it's just enormous and he had these big soft eyes but you could see he was so operant okay. you could see him watching and really paying it it was so neat to see um and and uh, paula's just this little slip of a woman i mean 
obviously, you know, most of our horses could drag us around if they want. Our donkey could drag me around and he's probably, you know, 500, 550 pounds. He could drag me around if he wanted to. So this guy, you know, he probably weighs almost a ton. And, and yet he was, he was very kind, very slow, very deliberate, like cattle. Um, but you could, his ears would swivel when she would click. Uh -huh. The ears would, and um, so we played around with food delivery to help him shift his weight off of the foot we wanted him to lift. Yeah. And um, so we did a little bit of like offset feeding. So feeding where um, he had to, you know, move his head over. And yeah. so instead of having him with his head, I said, you know, if he's got his head flung up, where does that push his weight down onto his front legs? Right. So that makes it harder to, you know, sort of get him to understand that we want him to lighten and shift. And we also, um, we had him step over some ground poles yeah. and click while he was, when, as he lifted his foot over the ground poles. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was just a, a short, short time, you know, it was a clinic and so, he, I worked with her for probably an hour, um, two days in a row. Um, but she went home and, and worked with him and got him to where he was lifting, doing, you know, front leg lifts. Great. Yeah, it was very cool. I was very impressed. But you could just see he, um, because especially, you know, since you keep cattle as livestock and we do too, the idea and I haven't spent a lot of time around like 4-H cattle, a little bit, but not much, or FFA cattle where that, you know, part of their life is to get in a trailer and go to an unfamiliar place and, you know, be stabled at that place for say a show or something. Um, but I know our cows would be pretty wigged out about, you know, and I mean, and, and he was tied to her trailer, you know, when he was not in his, in his, uh, his session because she wanted to watch the other sessions at the clinic so it was very it was just was you know I just kind of went okay you're feeding him this way is that necessary for this species or can we play with it and is there and is there any benefit in playing with it like I don't want to you know fix what's not broken if you know her, her way of feeding him works for the two of them I don't want to mess with it but I did want to explore if that would help with her goal of, of, you know, teaching him to lift his feet for um, hoof care on cue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and then the little lambs that you worked with, they were, that was somebody who... It's a client of mine that I've worked with off and on for a couple of years, and she has um, a, a collection, I'll say, of miniature horses. Um, okay, so minis are the other, you know, in, in that realm of horses, donkeys, minis are slightly yeah. different. Yeah. If nothing else, just, you know, how you, how you interact with them because of size and things. Right. Um, but she, this particular woman, she has some farm, a uh, little farm and it's right in town. So she's, uh, her goal is to have heritage, heritage animal breeds. And also some, I think, and and have sort of a, a working farm where people can come and see and be educated about um, about you know heritage breeds. And so she had all the, the minis were not, but she also has two Caspian horses, which are mm -hmm. um, a very rare breed. And she'd gotten these South Down baby doll sheep, which you know I know nothing about sheep but they are a heritage breed. And so she brought home these three lambs and they were, um, they were kind of afraid of us. And she, they were basically hiding in this shed that she'd set up as a shelter for them. And if you want, you know, it was, it was just like, you know, feral cats, you walk toward them and they were trying to climb any surface to get away from you um, but they like to eat you know it was the if you put the food down and you backed away they would come out to the bowl and eat so I said well let's see what we can do and um, I'll try to get you the 
the video clip, we we didn't video from the very beginning, but I did, again, I did sort of the Kay Lawrence, let's establish the pattern. So get them eating yeah. and understanding that they could get the food and then introduce the behavior. So I just set a little rubber pan down in the doorway of their shed and I sat down next to it and I had, I don't know, it was, you know, sheep chow or something like that. <laughs> some, some kind of sheep feed that she had, pellet, little tiny pelleted feed. And I just took a little pinch and I put it in the bowl and then I leaned back and I just sat still. And it took them probably a minute or so. And the boldest one came out and ate the stuff and I didn't move. And then he kind of looked around and then I just very quietly took another little pinch, reached over. And of course, as I reached, he backed off, went back into the shed. And I sprinkled that little pinch of food back into the bowl and then brought my hands back and just sat really quietly so that I wasn't any kind of, you know, disturbance. And he came back out and then I put another pinch down and very quickly, I think by the third or fourth pinch, he didn't back off when I, I, put the food he didn't go all the way back into the shed he backed off a tiny bit but he didn't so as he came that time as he came forward toward the bowl I stuck two fingers out kind of in his path and he stopped and he sniffed them and I made a tongue click and then I put another pinch of food down and then I held my fingers up and he touched my fingers and and I put a pinch of food down and then I could see his eyes come up and watch me and wait for me to bring my fingers up. It's like, oh, okay, operant sheep, <laughs> operant lamb. He's got it. And and it was very, very, very quick. And what was fascinating was um, he totally lost his fear of people after that. He literally would come, char if she came out of her little cottage, he would come charging out of the shed over to her. I showed her, I mean, she was there with me and she was uh, super excited about it. And I said, well, just now the two fingers, you know, I hold the two fingers out. And we started to, you know, hold them off to the side. So he had to change his path and touch my fingers. Yup, yeah. he could do that. And once he did it, the others, um, we didn't go through a really um, formal training process with the others, but they all lost their fear of people. And they they suddenly went, oh, people near my bowl. This is a good thing. I don't have to back off. And it, they just, it was like a 180. Yeah. So I was, you know, because people, I, I mean, I have a dear friend from years and years ago who was um, a big in pony club back where I used to live. And they had sheep. And she was, oh, sheep are just so dumb. They're just so dumb. And I just thought to myself, not like Nina Nina or anything, like, but like, oh, oh, if people only knew. These guys are, and now, I mean, she's had them now for, oh, two years or something. And, and, uh, well, I imagine you all had to very use social. four on the floor lessons and the no mugging from the horses. From what I know about friendly sheep is they're just as likely to put their front feet on your shoulders and go, what you got? Or on your back or anywhere else. So did you have to go through that with them or did they? I, you know, they haven't, they haven't done a lot of, of climbing on people, at least when I've been there. And she hasn't said that that was an issue, but I, I've, um, she, parents will let, will drive by, see the place and want to bring their children in. And she's invited them to do that. And I had to kind of create a rule for her minis in particular um, that, that everybody, because I spent one summer, I was supposed to be teaching them all these cool, it, working on their husbandry and teaching them tricks and things. And I literally spent the entire summer trying to remind them about no mugging. This is the minis. Yeah. And then I found out she was having all these people come and she would literally hand the kids like, you know, a coffee can of pellets and say, go in and feed them ponies. <laughs> they're like these four-year-old kids in there swarmed by the minis and I thought okay new rule when they give them they you know, have the little rubber feed bowls and they all have to put the feed in the bowl so the minis heads go down away from them and they're not getting it directly from people's hands because I can't make any progress with these guys if uh if if all I'm doing is trying to you know undo the, the lesson that they've learned from these people, yeah. which is hug and get fed. The public in there, your liability is huge if you don't teach 
people and animals. Exactly. Out. And so so the 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 sheep are now and she's gotten two more, two more, three more. So now there's is there five? Is there five or six? There's five. And um and they all have names and I can't remember uh, all of them now, but um Otis, Boo. What do you see as differences <laughs> um in distractions or concerns versus the different species. So I was just thinking when you were talking about this, how the donkeys that I work with, the clients that have, that have donkeys, their, their shed is actually, uh, um, I don't know how you say it, it's built into the side of this bank. So it's, it's dug out. It's like a bank bank. barn, but it's a bank shed. Right. And then there's a roof that comes out and is supported and it's metal. And so a lot, and she has goats. And a lot of times when we're working with the donkeys, there will be two little goat buck kids on the roof. On the roof, de 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 on the metal. And their little feet, you know, going bangity, bangity, bangity. <laughs> and the donkeys don't care in the least, but you know, something in the woods moves right. and freeze and startle. And I think, you know, that's so hoarse, you know, it doesn't matter what happens right here so much as what's coming over the horizon. That's well, this little farm with the minis, yeah. there's a, there's a, one of those go-kart, um, yes. <laughs> one of those go-kart racing tracks next door, literally yeah. next door. That doesn't phase them at all, but God help them, 4th of July, they're all terrified by the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, this, you know, and, and fireworks especially is like one of those things like, you know, not easy to, to train over about. Um, so, well, I will say um, with the steer, he, he would look off into the distance a little bit um, he was extremely curious about the horses that were at the clinic and the horses that were at the clinic were extremely concerned about him at first. Um, so we actually did a little work on, you know, the steer is not going to kill you. And they, they acclimated to the steer, but we did it with, you know, clicker work with like targeting and something simple at enough of a distance where they were aware of him but didn't feel like they had to leave the county and they got over their concern about the steer he um was very deliberate and thoughtful about things you know more in the line of the donkey like let me or or like my draft cross horses right there's such a difference i see in my horses that are draft crosses they're they're like let me think about this, assess the situation, and decide if it's worth the effort to run away. Whereas, you know, the thoroughbreds are like, you know, I'll get out of here and think about it later. And so uh, I find, I, I think probably having the draft crosses was a, a nice segue for me to the long ears because they definitely do um, think about things and assess things before they react. Okay. Um, and kind of similar, the things that they acclimate to don't bother them at all. Something novel, that's different. So, you know, Wes, my husband, um, likes to fix up old cars. So there's forever, there's welding and grinding and sparks flying and power tools going, or he's, you know, doing something with the tractor. He's cutting hay or he's, you know, fertilizing, or he's, you know, putting out hay for the animals and whatnot. So that stuff just doesn't phase any of my long ears. And uh, while I don't train our cows, um, I did actually do um, some uh, constructional approach training with one of our cows um, to, I guess it would be two years ago, we brought in uh, uh, we get weaned heifer calves at the auction and then we raise them up until they're ready to go on and be bred and be mothers. And we don't run a cow calf operation because neither of us wants to be laying in the slush at three in the morning, pulling a stuck calf. Um, not that either of us would know how to do that, frankly, I guess we would learn, but we don't want to be doing that. So we just raise these heifer calves. So we get these heifer calves and we got um, and they're always, of course, all bug-eyed and, you know, terrified for the first couple of days. 
and then they settle in and Wes is really quiet and methodically goes out and he puts feed in this big feed bunker and they eventually find their way there and realize and then they start to you know learn the antecedents which is the sound of his little his little ATV driving up and then they oh and they'll come zooming up the hill because they hear the ATV because he's going to be delivering the food I mean so we are training them I guess in a way but this one big Charolais mix big white uh calf was really she would not come eat if we were within 100 feet and she was really like wouldn't in and we feed them inside our our um, gathering pen so they get used to going in there and being in there right and so by the time that we need to gather them when we're going to sell them or if we need to doctor them or something they they just like they hear the gator and they go into the gathering pen come bring us food she would not go and um she was really spooky just you know that particular individual and i um and you could see she wanted to go in with them but if we stayed she would not go in so i got to i got in the hat i would take out a rubber feed bowl and i would put food in it and then i would back off far enough that she would come to the bowl and i did that <clears throat> for several days and i was able to back off less and less to the point where i was i could stand maybe 10 15 feet away from her yeah and then I did the same thing I did with the sheep where I didn't sit by it, but I literally, I put part of her feed into that bowl and then backed off the 10 or 15 feet and stood there. And then she ate. And when she finished eating, she looked up at me and I walked over just very quietly, didn't make eye contact, put some more feed in the bowl and back. And of course she backed away. Yeah. And then when I backed off, she came up to the bowl and ate. And then I went and put some more in and backed off. And then when she finished eating and she looked at me, it was like she was cueing me by looking at me. You look at me and I will come put more food in your bowl. And then I will back off as far as you need to feel safe to go eat. But I you know, got to where I could, I could go through that process like five times in, a, in each day of feeding. So within a week, I could put the food in and literally take one step back. And I actually got to the point where she would take cattle cubes from my hand. So it, it was, um, I wasn't using a marker signal. You know, I, I sort of figured my movement was the marker. Yeah. Right. And exactly. she, she understood that when I walked, when I, when I started to move, I would be bringing food to the bowl. So I was initiating the reinforcement process and she triggered that by looking at me yeah and so she yeah. got to <clears throat> so interesting is because when you were talking about the the lambs it was you would put the food and i don't know how far <laughs> back you were moving but so this just opens up a whole big thing because i've worked with really feral dogs too you know people who've adopted dogs and <clears throat> you know they won't come anywhere near you and so the it just opens up this whole Pandora's box of, do you move? Do you let them move? Because one of the things I remember learning um, at Natural Encounters was he talked about watching how far back they retreated and saying the success is in, as when you have an animal who's retreating, the fact that every time they retreat less and less and less. So there's a choice option there that mm -hmm. doesn't happen when, um when we're retreating and we're sort of setting that up so it's just i mean that's why i love thinking about all these different animals right. and, different and, and i'll be honest i mean in those situations uh, it was experimentation exactly. on my part it, it, and it's sort of i uh, uh, oftentimes i mean i'm sure you run into this with with your clients where you know you come in and they may not have chosen to work with you because you're a positive reinforcement trainer right they just the vet or somebody told them that you could help them with their problem. And yeah. so um, you don't come in, you know, flying the flag. It's just, well, this is how we're going to do it. And they, you know, uh, you, you get that really, uh, but, but shouldn't we, don't we have to, you know, but shouldn't I be telling her no? And, you know, and, and I don't really, 
you know, I don't get into an argument about it. I just kind of casually, I try to demonstrate and show, but for some situations where they're seeing a change in their dog and the session's over and I say, okay, you know, I'll check in with you in a week. And, and they're like, I don't know. I just don't know about this. I'll say, indulge me. Try, will you try this for a week? Just all I ask is that you try this for one week and see if there's an improvement. And so I go into these situations where I'm running into a new species or even just an individual of a species, right? I mean, we had 39 cows that were perfectly happy to walk into the, into yeah. the, the gather pen. And we had one who was really spooky and she actually influenced a couple of them and made them more spooky. Mm. Like they were better and then they got worse as she would, you know, she would like literally run away. And so then some of them were like, <gasps> what do we need to be worried about? And so that's partly why I decided to work with her because we didn't want it to sort of end up being sort of reverse sensitization right. into the whole herd of cows. And, and so I'll go in and say, all right, you know, is this a situation where I should start with the food delivery? Is this a situation where, you know, I should back off or I should have them back off? And, and my sense to be honest, I tend to default to me backing off rather yeah. than having them back off because they've already got a pattern, Yeah, right? Backing off is already a habit for them. And I want that to no longer be, you know, I mean, if the best I can get is that they back off less and less progressively, yeah. I'll take that. But I find just like this whole... Um, movement within our community of consent cues and um, sort of choice and control and, you know, looking, looking for some kind of signal from the individual that they're ready, whether it's yeah. Sammy, Sammy making eye contact saying, okay, you can pull the halter on over my nose now, um, that I see progress faster when I say, I'm willing to be the one to back off. I know that I'm the big, the big boogie monster. So I'm willing to be the one to back off and I will let you, you know, so that I, I want you to, to back up as little as possible because I know that flight is already your sort of default response in these situations. So I would like to minimize that. And I want to show you, I'll back off. Yeah. I recognize that I am a threat. You perceive me as a threat at this time. And I want to show you that I'm not as much of a threat. So, and that's just, you know, that's just the conversation that's going on in my head. I have no idea, obviously, what's going on in their heads. But I do find, because like you, I've ended up working with some of these pathologically fearful dogs um, that, um, that I make faster progress when I don't intrude on them and I let them um, th th there is a difference between the animal running away and initiating movement towards you. Yeah. There yeah. just is. There's got to be an internal difference in, in them. And yeah. so if I can get them to initiate the movement forward uh, by backing off, I'm all about it. <clears throat> and, and you backing off is added reinforcement. They've gotten a truth. Exactly. And then you've also backed off. Um, but sometimes I also think there are individuals where you backing off is movement and right be scary absolutely so but, right and yeah. that's i think that's where you know just going up and and uh you know putting some food in the bowl and then backing off off as far as you can and just literally not expecting any kind of improvement at first but just to show right. them the right. process this is how I'm going to move. And that's all I'm going to do. That's what I did with the lamb was I'm sitting right next to your bowl, or I'm sitting, you know, two feet away. And all I'm going to do is take my hand and sprinkle some of your little uh, lamb chow in the bowl. And I'm going to bring my hands back and I'm going to become uh, stationary. Yeah. And I'm going to become motionless. And I will just sit there quietly and let you do your thing. And, uh, and so, you know, the first couple of times was just to show him this is the pattern, just like with the, the muzzle, right? This is where the food's going to get placed on the ground. And, oh, there might be something around the food after the first couple of times, but I'm just going to be putting food on the ground and that's it. 
so that's really you know the the it the it's really clear to the learner yeah um but it, it is i i do feel that i've benefited a lot and my i feel like the animals i work with have benefited greatly from the other animals i've worked with right. as well as the amazing inspirational people that i've learned from um because of that because i've i've broadened my repertoire as a trainer and of the questions, how I pose the questions and the questions that I ask. Yeah, yeah. And it is, you know, and sometimes it can be frustrating because people say, oh, well, you're a horse trainer. Well, no, I need somebody who works with dogs or they'll say, so how much do you do with horses and how much as if- Or, or you have no experience with German shepherds? Well, oh God, yes. Okay. The dog breeds. <laughs> they get the breed stuff, you know? Oh uh, yeah. And even the horse stuff, like, well, you know, but you have draft crosses. You don't know anything about Arabians. Like, well, aside from the fact that actually I do know a little bit about Arabians, it's like, yeah. I ended up starting, I finally started keeping a list so that when I got that question, I could go, no, I haven't worked with a, but I have worked with these other 25 breeds. And that doesn't always So they're 25 me. doodles. They're, <laughs> yeah. The different oodle. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the oodle oodles right right yeah but, yeah but, well and and sometimes i'll i'll say well you know one of the my great inspirations is a woman uh who who trained i'll say and she she's trained a lot of different animals and she trained a hermit crab to ring a bell and they kind of look at me like what and i go and her motto is if it has a brain stem and it eats you can it can learn right. and they kind of go oh and i'm like so we'll just you know figure out what's going to work with your dog <laughs> yeah. yeah no it is it's fun and i think i mean I, you and I work with more domestic, you know, farm-based animals typically, right. whereas some people have a lot of experience with more exotic type animals, but. Oh, I mean, when I, my, our friend Lisa, uh, who yeah. they, was part of that team that trained the alligator to go into a crate. Yeah, yeah, see, crate <laughs> training is, crate training. Alligator is training. training. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was a long, slow process. Yeah. I mean, I have I have tremendous respect for a lot of the um, the 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 zoo and and uh, aquarium people because the species they work with, you know, for instance, you know, we are so spoiled. Like our horses will train. Like I have to stop at about forty five minutes. I have exhausted all my brain glucose. I can't focus anymore. And the horse is like, "Why are you stopping? I can still eat pellets." <laughs> Right. And the idea that, you know, you can you can train, you know, you can be able to give like eight reinforcers today or eight reinforcers in this session yeah. is really it, it, it was really well when I went through KPA with our very ancient bull terrier and she could train for one minute. And then she would just, if I, and so I was like, I gotta start being able to do longer sessions. Like they're telling us to work for two minutes so we could do one. So I'm like, maybe we could do a minute and 15 seconds. No, she would just go off into the 55 second stare after a minute. I'm like, that was it. No, can't do a minute and 15 second session. And I had to reorganize my thinking a lot about, okay, so I couldn't just go in open-ended like I would with the horses, like, you know, train until, you know, I, I can't think anymore. It was, I have to, you know, how do I use that minute? Yeah. Right. What, what, um, what am I gonna, what am I gonna, you know, focus on and, and, and what if, you know, if we reach this criteria, where do I bump next or how do I change or what do I do with that one minute? Now I could give her, you know, I could give her an hour off and we could go back and do another minute. <laughs> Good. Good. As opposed but, to the birds who get eight pellets of food per day. So that's all you get. Better, you better make those you eight pellets them count. Make sure you didn't give them an extra seed yesterday and they're, you know, way too much today. And that's right. So they won't be able to fly or something. And right. yeah, I mean, so I have tremendous respect for um, those trainers because uh, they really have to, they really have to look at the long game. Yeah. 
They yeah. really do. So, so worthwhile to work with different species as you can, but also to learn from others and watch others. I mean, you know, those and, things. and watch other people training the same species you do that that yeah. maybe come from a different background. Yeah. Like for, for example, when we were working with Johan the steer and she had wanted to work on hoof lifts, I reached out to someone that um, I've never met in person, but I kind of know of through, you know, mutual friends who works at a zoo, but works with the domestic animals. And they have, a, they had a steer, he's a, some kind of small breed and, and he has horns, <laughs> let me tell you. And oh, they, no. they went through a very um, detailed training process for him for hoof care because he, you know, he really needed the hoof care and they didn't want to just, you know, put him in a squeeze and tilt him and, you know, trim up his feet like is done with, with cattle normally. And so, you know, and I was thinking about it from the perspective of our horses and as somebody who trims my own horses and has a little hoof stand and everything and how we should work on it with this guy. Well, he, this guy had um, built a, literally a platform and padded it with fire hose and stuff to create a really nice supportive platform for this steer to rest his, his, his whole lower leg on. Oh. And they trained it, you know, for him to do that as opposed to I'm used to, you know, supporting it, yeah. the hoof or resting it on a hoof stand. And and this was, you know, this very, was very sturdy. And I thought, well, yeah, Cindy, I mean, this steer weighs 1800 pounds or something. He probably, you know, and, and he's less, he's not built for, you know, high leg action, like horses or even donkeys or mules. And so the idea that, you know, oh, you, you know, you should know your species, he could probably use more support as part of the hoof, you know, the, the foot lifting for the actual, you know, teach him that so that he can really sustain keeping the foot off the ground. And, uh, and, and so I had conversations yeah. with him about that, like, well, okay, you know, show me, and he sent me pictures, and he was very encouraging and supportive. And so, you know, it, so here's somebody else who's bringing in a completely different, and he had worked with marine mammals, and, um, captive wolves and uh and some other species at uh like a wildlife park and so he came into working with the domestic animals from a completely different perspective than you and I who have had you know dirt and horse hair under our nails you know as long as we could walk and um uh, and so, you know, it's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. And so, you know, how other people work with the same species um, is always instructive. Yeah, so. Well, it's been great. Thank you very much. I know you have other obligations to get to as I do, but this well, has been fun. Thank you. I don't you. want to bore anybody anyway. It has been great. I love, you know, I love that you and I can share these experiences because, there's the places where our experiences overlap and then the places where you know you bring great new stuff to me and and hopefully i um tickle your interest periodically too absolutely absolutely it's great i have learned a bunch from you and appreciate it all so well i enjoy i and i greatly enjoy all of your patreon um content oh well thank you thank so. you okay. all right Thanks for doing this. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk again soon. It's my pleasure. Bye. Bye.